Welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast, where we talk to C-level leaders from across the payments landscape. We'll be discussing the products and services that impact the payment space today, as well as trends and predictions for the future of payments. We will also hear stories from our guests about their journeys to the top. Hi, everyone. This is the host, Greg Myers of the Leaders in Payments podcast. And on today's show, we have Kathleen Pierce Gilmore, or better known as KPG. She is the head of payments at Silicon Valley Bank. And this is episode 173 of the Leaders in Payments podcast, and more specifically, the first episode in our special Women Leaders in Payments month. So Kathleen, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So first, tell us a little bit about Silicon Valley Bank and the role that it plays in the payments ecosystem? Sure. Well, Silicon Valley Bank is a bank that a lot of average consumers may not have heard of. If you're in the innovation economy, you definitely know about us. We are the bank of innovation. So we bank private equity firms, venture capital firms, accelerators and incubators, as well as the many companies in the innovation economy from fintechs, life sciences, you name it, they are our customers. And so one of our big segment of innovating customers is fintechs and software platforms. And not only do we serve these clients as their commercial bank, right? So we give them a checking account, an operating account. We also are the bank that they go to when they need a bank to provide infrastructure or access to a bank license for embedded payments. So we serve them as a commercial bank, also as a private bank for founders and management team members who need mortgages and the like. We have an investment bank. So as our clients are going through their journey, we're able to support them in their investment banking needs, whether it's fundraising, doing an acquisition, being acquired, doing an IPO. And then of course, SVB Capital, which has a significant fund of funds, over $7 billion in assets under management, where we actually invest in companies that we gain exposure to through being in the innovation economy. So we have multiple ways that we support our clients. And in the payment space, as I was saying before, we are their commercial bank. So we'll provide them a commercial card, access to merchant services, and the ability to move money in the context of cash management solutions. And that that embedded payment space where we're actually enabling them to incorporate financial services and payments into their value proposition, into their business model. Okay, great. Thanks for that explanation. So as the head of payments there, can you tell us what your specific roles and responsibilities are? Yeah, so I am essentially the general manager of all payment solutions. We have, as I was saying, on our proprietary payment side, our commercial card. So a lot of folks will have heard of the innovators card as an example. And this is your typical commercial card for any company that's trying to manage expenses all the way from a very small startup that might just be a handful of founders to clients that are post-IPO success stories, very large corp fin clients, and also our global funds banking clients. So commercial card, merchant services, cash management, really anything that involves the movement of money that a bank would typically offer. And then the other part that I manage is embedded payment solutions. And we've been in this business for quite a while now. We have our OBO, as we call it, on behalf of payment solutions, where we are allowing our clients the ability to, as we say, ride our rails. So ACH, wires, cross-border payments, in order to incorporate payment services into their value proposition. And then also, we've recently launched our PayFAC business. PayFAC is an abbreviation for payment facilitation, where we are essentially enabling our clients to act like an acquiring bank. And that means underwriting and onboarding sub-merchants into their platform, whether they are a fintech or a software platform, the ability to offer their clients card acceptance is, again, what we call the payback business. So I manage all of that, and that includes the infrastructure, both technology and risk management infrastructure that goes into delivering those payment services. And then lastly, but not least, we have a number of partnerships that both support and monetize our payment solutions business. So you've probably heard of some of our partnerships. One that got a bunch of exposure was our Modern Treasury partnership. And we work together with Modern Treasury to enhance our payment solutions for our mutual clients. So all of that is part of my team. And then, of course, I work 
very closely with partners across SVB, including our technology and operations and second line risk teams and, you know, a lot more beyond that. It's a very broad and deep role you have there. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Awesome. Awesome. Well, let's rewind a little bit and let's talk about your background. So where did you grow up and what was your life like when you were growing up? It's a good question, and it actually is a big driver of why I ended up in financial services. So the way I would summarize it is very unstable. I was born in Las Vegas, Nevada. I lived there until I was about nine when my parents got divorced and then moved to Southern California with my mom and future stepdad. And we moved a bunch. I think I went to three different seventh grades and lived in four different places during my seventh grade year. And I have a seventh grader right now, and I can only imagine (laughs) how difficult that was. And so we suffered from pretty severe financial insecurity. And I've talked about this before. Poverty is not just an economic state. There's a lot more that goes into living in poverty and not having financial security as a family. There's I think far too many Americans that struggle with this and we we summarize it into an economic condition, but it goes well beyond that. So instability is is how I best describe it. Okay. Did you know growing up what you wanted to be when you grew up? I certainly knew I wanted to be financially stable in terms of where my curiosities were and what I wanted to do for a job. I cycled through so many different ideas. You know, at some point, I think I wanted to be a marine biologist. I wanted to be a florist. I think eventually, as I got into my high school years, I was extremely interested in science. And so I decided I wanted to be a scientist. And specifically, I wanted to be a neuroscientist. And that's actually a big part of what shaped my high school experience was my love for math and science. Okay, that's a good segue into the next question. What extracurricular activities did you do in high school? I would describe myself as a professional nerd in high school. (laughs) (laughs) I was on our academic league team. You know, I don't know if you've ever seen there. It's actually sometimes on TV. Kids basically get asked questions, they hit a buzzer and then answer the questions, you know, hopefully they're right, but answer as quickly as they can versus another team. So I did things like that. I was in our key club, which is sponsored by Kiwanis. It's basically kids who want to do good. And I think I really wanted to save the world. (laughs) If I look back at how I spent my time, I also growing up in the San Diego area, I really loved going to the beach. I think I tried to be a surfer for a number of years. And I say try because I never really quite was successful, (laughs) but certainly enjoyed trying. I also had a very young brother and sister. They were significantly younger than me, and I spent a lot of time taking care of them. I actually quite enjoyed spending time with little people. So that's kind of how I spent my time. So I assume right after high school, you went to Northwestern. So maybe talk about your experience there. What did you major in? You know, how did you like that? How did you get there from California to Northwestern? Yeah, it's so funny. I was thinking about this. I was really intrigued. So there was a former classmate that had gone to Northwestern and came back and spoke at my high school. And I don't know why it just, it kind of piqued my curiosity. And I was learning about Northwestern. I discovered they had this program called the Integrated Sciences Program. And it was a very small focused program for science nerds like myself. It was very intense. It was equivalent to majoring in chemistry, biology, math, physics, and it also had some computer science in there as well. And it was targeted for people who knew they wanted to go into science and it was an accelerated program. So you could essentially graduate faster and cover a lot of ground if you wanted to do a PhD. So that's how I got interested in Northwestern. And then when I got there and I started to go through the program I even did research over my summer freshman year. I studied circadian rhythms on Siberian hamsters. It was really, really fascinating. But I realized pretty quickly that the life of a scientist really wasn't the life that I wanted. It felt very, very narrow. And I realized pretty early on that it wasn't going to be a great existence (laughs) for me. I I like the intellectual stimulation of science, but I, I didn't necessarily want that to be my life. So I really branched out. I did a lot. I worked a lot mostly because I had to in order to afford school. But I also just loved all of the experiences I was getting. I was in the undergraduate leadership program, which was just an incredible experience. I covered a lot of leadership principles to this day that I still hold near and dear to my heart. So 
overall, I'd say it was pretty intense. I got really sick in my senior year. I had strep throat and mono, of all things, multiple times, and I almost didn't graduate. (laughs) I was doing really well up until that last quarter. I think it was the second quarter of quantum mechanics that really did me in. So it was intense, and I feel like I crawled over the finish line, but I just... I look back and it was life-changing for me to go to Northwestern and I just saw so much more of what was possible for myself and in the world. So I'd say I'm pretty grateful for that experience. So did you change your major? Did you stay in the sciences? I stayed in the sciences. And what I discovered is the analytical thinking that you have to do when you're, whether you're solving an equation in quantum mechanics or you're planning out a set of reactions in organic chemistry, the analytical mindset applies to pretty much any problem solving. So when I went through the recruiting process in my senior year, I discovered in a lot of the companies that were recruiting on campus, a strong interest in that analytical mindset. I now understand it certainly in business myself. And so I didn't change my major. The integrated sciences program, once you get in, it's really hard to want to do anything else. So I finished it. I saw it through, but decided to do something very different when I graduated. Okay. So you crawled across the finish line. You got your (laughs) diploma. What was your first job? What did you do right after college? I went into consulting and there were a lot of consulting firms that recruited at Northwestern. And I got to tell you, I did not really know what that meant, (laughs) but I knew that it was a decent financial offer. And like I said before, I was very focused on financial stability. I was trying to specifically live in Boston. Uh, My significant other at the time was going to be in Boston. And so I ended up working for, it started off as Ernst & Young and eventually was acquired by Capgemini. So it became Capgemini Ernst & Young. So I went into consulting. And what I'll tell you is I had no idea what I was getting into. I Even after a few years of being in consulting, I couldn't describe it to my mom in less than 30 minutes. (laughs) I tried explaining to her, I solve problems. I build Excel spreadsheets. I make slides. And she just, like, she couldn't understand what I was talking about. But I got so much experience and just got thrown into crazy situations. I remember working directly for a CFO of a cable company to build a valuation model for getting into the telephony business. And I'm very much dating myself now. It was the the very early onset of voice over IP technology. So I worked on a bunch of things that I never would have thought of. I certainly didn't seek them out, but it stretched me in a lot of different ways. Okay, so we're at your first job out of college and you're consulting now as the head of payments at Silicon Valley Bank. So tell us how you got to to Silicon Valley Bank from the consulting company. Yeah, so at some point I started to get very tired of the travel. And I also was craving that sense of connection you get from from results. You know, in consulting, you go from project to project. And if you're lucky, you might stay with a client for a couple of years, but never get to be a part of the follow through. And so I was craving having something I was connected to and could point to as the thing that I did, in addition to wanting to settle down and not be traveling as much. And so it's funny, I think back to how I thought of American Express, and I literally just thought, I love American Express. I had a corporate card from my consulting days. I got my own personal card. I really believed in the model of the charge card, you know, you pay it every month. And for the way I grew up, my parents really struggled with credit card debt. It started off as a means of survival and it very much became this vicious cycle that we were stuck in my entire upbringing. So I was very anti-credit card and I always liked this notion that Amex's charge card, you pay it off every month. And so I had this affinity for Amex as a customer And I was sharing with a girlfriend my admiration for the company. I'd read something that Ken Chenault was quoted in. And she connected me to a former classmate of hers that was in the strategic planning group at American Express, which is their internal consulting team. And I got to tell you, I just feel like I won the lottery being connected at the right time into that group. They happened to be looking at hiring some experienced undergrads. And I got the job. And I wasn't completely conscious of what was driving me to go to work for American Express. I just 
remember thinking, it's a cool brand. I like the product. I like the company. And it was after I left Amex that I realized what was driving me was that that fierce desire for financial stability and for financial discipline, financial responsibility. And so I loved Amex. I, I thought I was going to retire from Amex, but I got recruited away by Capital One. And a big driver in that decision was we were living in Jersey City when I was working for American Express. And we had three small children at the time. And as much as we loved living there, it was not easy And when I was getting recruited by Capital One, I got to see what it would be like to live in the D.C. area. And we just fell in love. And so for family reasons, and it also felt like a really exciting opportunity to grow and develop and take on a bigger role, we made the move and I went to Capital One. And I always say that I learned so much in the very first day that I went to Capital One. The contrast of the American Express business model and the Capital One business model just really brought to light for me how I thought about serving customers in financial services and the contrast of serving affluent customers and subprime customers. And certainly I related to the subprime customers more. I just started to have a lot more realization of my own values and my own drivers. And so I spent the four years that I was at Capital One growing as a human. I also was feeling for the first time in my entire life, that being a woman might actually be a detractor in my environment. I always felt like I had an edge by being a woman. A woman in science is pretty rare at the time that I was going through my science program. And at American Express, I felt very included for being a woman. Having my, ba- I had my babies while I was at Amex. And at Capital One, they hadn't quite made enough progress on their journey of increasing diversity and inclusion. So I also had to develop a confidence that is required when you're, when you're not the norm and your differences are not necessarily recognized and celebrated. So over the four years that I was at Capital One, I would say I came into my own as a leader and as a change agent. I started off by losing my confidence and feeling a little lost. And then I realized that all of that upbringing and that experience I had struggling in my life was actually my value proposition at Capital One. I could relate to our customers in a way that a lot of the other executives couldn't. And I started to create a voice for myself and make that a platform. It was not easy. It was, you know, I felt like the odd person out very frequently, but I grew so much. And when I decided to leave Capital One, I really wanted to I basically stopped thinking about KPG and my career and getting promoted and making money and wanted to maximize my impact. And once again, just the stars aligned for me and I got the opportunity to go to PayPal. And this is right when PayPal was spinning off of eBay and Dan Schulman came in as the CEO to take the company through that next chapter. And he was very focused on this mission around creating greater access to the global economy for the underserved. And up to that point, I thought PayPal was a way to send friends money via email addresses <laughs> and uh, certainly had thought about PayPal as a threat or a competitor when I was at American Express. And we were trying to figure out the impact it was going to have on our online business. And here it just it hit me. It's technology that is going to change financial services. And it's technology that's going to make it possible for more people like my family to have greater access and to have stronger, beneficial financial services that actually help them and don't hurt them. And I also just remember feeling like banks and financial services companies needed to do better and needed to be more accountable in how they delivered financial products. So I had the chance to go to PayPal and lead the consumer credit business. And it was just an incredible, it really pivoted my career and helped me see a whole new world. I actually, that's when I first started to get a lot of exposure to startups and technology companies and just that whole innovation economy. And then from there, I decided to go into the innovation economy directly. I went to a startup that was focused on payments. I then ended up leaving with a few people and starting a company from scratch that was focused on enabling cryptocurrency to be accepted at the point of sale. And 
what excited me about this was it is a breakthrough technology. Digital currency just makes a ton of sense. I feel like it's so obvious. <laughs> I, I almost still can't believe that there was ever a question that cryptocurrency or digital currency, as I preferred to call it at the time, just makes sense with all of the operational inefficiency and fraud and terrible customer experience that exists in payments, both for consumers and for merchants. It just makes a ton of sense to have this transformational way of moving money. And so I, I launched into that. I will say that the startup world is a very different experience from working at a regulated institution. <laughs> There's a lot of variety in what you experience. And so then ended up leaving that and actually ended up getting exposure to a bunch of different startups and was doing a lot of advising. I, I joined the board of a buy now, pay later company called Sezzle. And then I actually got to lead an executive search firm for the QED investors portfolio. That was an incredible experience, got even more exposure to a variety of startups. And then during the onset of COVID, left the search firm and was catching my breath. Frankly, I had five kids at home all of a sudden. And in the very beginning, we had no school. There wasn't even virtual learning. So I had to dive right into being a full-time mom. <laughs> and as I was going through that experience, I got reconnected to a colleague at Silicon Valley Bank. And I had spoken to SVB about a year and a half prior but I couldn't relocate. My crazy family <laughs> setup just was going to be impossible to move across the country. But because of COVID, Silicon Valley Bank changed how they were thinking about location and it opened up an opportunity. And what I'll tell you, Greg, is I really had no idea how cool of a job I was coming into. But when I started to think about it, the idea of being at a bank that is working with literally thousands of startups that are innovating in financial services. I couldn't imagine a more impactful way to spend my time. And to be at a bank that holds so valuable, this notion of integrity and client centricity and empathy, it feels like home. I actually was saying to a fellow executive when I joined, I really feel like I came home. It just feels like such a great fit. And I get to be in a high integrity environment but I also get to spend time with innovation companies. Like I was sharing with you earlier, I work with clients like Orem and inspiring leaders like Stephanie Kirkpatrick or the CEO of Tala, Shivani Soroya. Like that's actually part of my job. <laughs> I get paid to work with these incredible companies. So that's how I landed here. It's a long-winded way of saying it was a, never a straight line for me, and I don't expect my future to be a straight line either. A lot of stars aligning and having my eyes open at, at different times to opportunities that came my way. Yeah, it's interesting just listening and in my mind, connecting the dots of you were at a bank and you took the best parts of being there and then you went and discovered the startup world and payments. And then you put all those connected, those three dots. And now at Silicon Valley Bank, you're kind of back to like put meshing those all together. So kind of like you said, it sounds like it was kind of like the perfect storm of all those things coming together. So it's, it's a fascinating story. Yeah, it's I mean, it really is kind of I never would have if you were to ask me uh, my 16 year old self, I never would have come up with this. <laughs> Like this was definitely not planned, but I feel incredibly fortunate to be here now. That's awesome. That's awesome. So let's switch gears a little bit and we're going to talk about women leadership and more specifically women leaders in payments. So on the front of leadership and your style and sort of how you lead, what would you say are some of your guiding principles? Yeah. And I feel very lucky when I was at American Express, we had a very strong focus on emotional intelligence. And there was this guy, Doug Lenick. He was a very senior executive at Amex and a friend of Ken. Like he did a lot of advising for Ken and he took us through an emotional intelligence course. And one of the key parts of that was understanding your own values. So I had the good fortune of going through this very intentional exercise of understanding what drives me, what centers me very early on. And I've been amazed through the years to see how it's stayed so consistent. So my four key values or guiding principles are integrity, 
And it really is about doing the right thing and being accountable. Excellence. I just always feel like quality is free. Why not do a good job, whether you're mowing your lawn or putting together a presentation? Compassion. And this one has so much more meaning for me now, especially as a mom. Compassion is just kind of the center of everything. And then happiness. I really believe that everyone can be happy, even when you're coming from challenging circumstances. So these four words are very easy way to summarize me at any given time. And they sort of manifest differently in different circumstances. But those are the four things that I kind of rest on. Okay. And you mentioned a few people that you met throughout your career and that maybe inspired you a little bit. Were there other people that aspired or inspired you along the way? And then would you consider them mentors or did you have mentors today or are you a mentor? So kind of like the people in your life that have made you who you are is kind of the, the theme of the question. Yeah. You know, I think I study people like I'm so fascinated by humans. So I'm constantly taking in what I want to be more of and what I want to be less of by observing others. So I really feel like I am constantly surrounded by mentors. And I traditional definition of the word, I think of Elizabeth Rutledge, who is now the CMO of American Express. And she embodied integrity and accountability for me. Like I felt so fortunate to have worked under her leadership. There's a woman that actually worked for me at Capital One, Jess Bielek. And I just really developed a strong bond with her. She lives not too far away. She's my running buddy. She's a fellow mom. She's a fellow female executive in payments. And she might tell you that I mentor her, but (laughs) what she doesn't realize is how much I'm getting out of all the time that we spend together. I also, I don't necessarily need to know the person to get something from them. One of the people that I've learned a ton from is Brene Brown. I watched this video that she did on, I think it was a TED Talk on the notion of shame and vulnerability, and it was life-changing. I've probably watched that 20-minute video, I don't know, 20 times. And then I think of leaders like Ken Chenault. He was the CEO the entire time as I was at American Express, and I remember him inspiring a sense of change agency in all of us. He was actually an alum of the strategic planning group that I was very fortunate to be a part of. And he used to host these alumni meetings. And I remember him really emphasizing our duty as change agents. And and I think that's shaped me so much. I have a long list. I'm constantly taking in things that are inspiring when I observe, and also things that I experience or see that I don't want to be. I often live in contrast of what I learn from others. Yeah, it's interesting thinking about the way you're describing it, because I think in a lot of companies, in a lot of people's minds, and this can be male or female, they feel like mentorship has to be this prescriptive thing, right? Like, I have to join this group to be a mentor or to get a mentor. And I think sort of what you've just talked about is, you don't have to do that. Like you can learn so much from people that you don't even know. I mean, I think that's a that's something that all of us should try to do more of and be better at and not rely on some program that you have to go through through your job or some some group you have to join to be a mentor. I mean, you can be a mentor and get mentored in a lot of other ways. Yeah, I completely agree. I often joke that some of my greatest learning has come from my kids. <laughs> I read the book, How to Talk So That Your Kids Will Listen and How to Listen So That Your Kids Will Talk or something like that. I remember reading that when my oldest was just a couple of years old. And what I will tell you is it was actually changing how I was operating at work more than anything. (laughs) So whether it's in the workplace or in your home life, I think mentorship is everywhere. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, what is one characteristic that you believe every woman leader should possess? You know, I was really thinking about this question, and it's so hard to say one thing, but I really feel like compassion is at the core of everything. What compassion means to me is a level of acceptance and acceptance of where you are at any given time. And I emphasize self-compassion especially. And part of why I think it's so important is if you're willing to forgive yourself and have compassion for where you are at any given moment, it means that you're open to not being perfect. And that is the beginning of a growth mindset and the beginning of growth and development and the ability to learn and take in more. 
if you're not in a state of self-compassion and compassion for others, it can come off as judgmental or static or closed off. And it's really hard. I mean, sometimes I think it's easier to have compassion for others than it is to have compassion for yourself. But I don't think you can fully have compassion for others unless you have that compassion for yourself. I also think grit is incredibly important. Curiosity and the ability to just kind of follow a problem-solving process with a sense of eagerness and curiosity, I think that's actually where grit comes from. But if you don't have compassion for yourself, you're closing yourself off from what's possible. Yeah, that's, uh, I think all of those things are spot on. And many of them, I think, are true for both male and female leaders, right? So you mentioned this word grow, and I think there's a challenge in people who reach a certain level. How do you continue to grow? What do you do to ensure that you're growing and developing as a leader? I mean, you may be over X number of people and and the time begins to, it's harder to find time to spend on yourself. But what do you specifically do to help you grow as a leader? I am constantly trying to slow down. <laughs> I, By definition, I am impatient and I have a high sense of urgency and I move fast and I I'm ambitious and I have high standards and all of that might be great, but I try to force myself to slow down and reflect. So I reflect a lot. I really look for patterns, both in my own behaviors and experiences and relationships. And I also try to observe other people's patterns and then learn from that. I would say I'm a bit of a self-help guru. My kids make fun of me every time something happens, I turn it into a motivational speech. (laughs) But I just, I genuinely believe you can do better and you can change your life. I mean, I, I think part of the, what I got from my upbringing was an absolute determination to do better and to be what I wanted to be, to sort of declare a goal and go after it. But in order to do that, you have to be able to reflect and do something different than what your tendencies lead you to. I also really value feedback. And feedback is such an interesting thing. It's so hard to give. It's so hard to receive. And it is the number one ingredient to understanding what you need to do differently. And the ability to maintain a sense of self-awareness, I just think, comes from feedback. And The other thing I've learned far too many times, actually, is that the best and most useful feedback is usually the hardest feedback to receive and to embrace. But if you can have the courage to take it in, it can be life-changing. Yeah, I would agree. So let's talk a little bit about, let's say, women coming out of college. Maybe they're in their first, second job. Maybe they're 10 years in, mid-level management what advice would you give them so they want to be a leader, they want to move up in the company, they want to do more, they want to be successful, they have that motivation? What would you tell them they should do, sort of that next generation of female leaders? And it doesn't have to be payment specific, right? But what would you tell them they should do to be successful? Yeah, I would say don't focus on being successful, actually. (laughs) If I could go back in time and give advice to my 22-year-old self, I would say stop trying to prove to the world how great you are and just learn. Focus on solving problems and start by understanding those problems and figuring out what is exciting to you and what you're passionate about, what you care about, and focus on those problems. And don't ever feel like you've solved it. Don't ever let yourself feel like you've gotten the final answer because there really is no such thing in life. There is no answer at the end of the book. (laughs) If I think about the times where I had the most growth and development myself as a leader, it's when I was so enthralled with a particular problem, and I mean business problem, really, that I lost my focus of caring about my career trajectory or my next promotion or my next review when I was so entrenched in solving a problem, especially when it involved a team. That's when I learned the most. That's when I grew the most. And that is also when I was the most successful at the different points in my career. And at the times where I was focused on getting promoted or quote unquote, being successful or getting recognition for my accomplishments, that's actually when I wasn't growing. That is when I was the least effective, both individually and as a leader. 
And I constantly remind myself of this and try to influence my own team, like focus on the problems that you're solving, focus on the impact that you want to have and success will follow. Okay. And let's kind of talk about, and I'll bring it into the payments industry How do you think we're doing in this industry as far as having female leaders, whether that's CEOs, C-level executives, sort of upper management? How do you think we're doing there? And then what else could we be doing better or different? Yeah, you know, I think we have a long ways to go. And I know we're talking about women in payments, but I would say this applies to any kind of diversity. When I look at places where we're having great success, the thing I observe over and over again is it starts at the top. (laughs) It starts with the board, the CEO, the founding team, the senior management, the partners from the investment firms that are backing the company. It starts at the top. And if you don't have a strong focus on diversity from the beginning, from the top, it's really hard to correct that over time. So I look at companies like Tala. I think I mentioned this already. Shivani Soroya is the founder and CEO of Tala. She's just incredible. And if you look at her team, she has built what I think is the most diverse team I've ever seen. (laughs) But it starts with her and it cascades out. I look at Stephanie Kirkpatrick, the CEO of Orem, who has had a very strong focus on diversity as she's built her team and her board. And again, it cascades down. Then you look at companies that don't necessarily have a starting point of diversity, even if they care about it and they're trying to like increase diversity. It's really hard if you don't have that from the beginning, whether you're a large bank or a small startup. Starting at the top, I think, is where it begins. And so I think we have a long ways to go. I, again, have the good fortune of working with a whole bunch of different companies, small, medium, large, and their investment firms that serve them. And I don't see enough diversity and it's self-perpetuating. So I think it starts at the top. I also think that I've observed a lot of focus on hiring diverse talent and not enough focus on making people feel comfortable once they're in the company. <laughs> like it doesn't do you any good to hire a woman into a leadership position if she's then made to feel like she has to act like a man to be successful. You're losing the very essence of the diversity she's bringing to the table. So I think a stronger focus on acceptance and inclusion will go a long way in fostering greater diversity over time. Does Silicon Valley Bank have specific programs around diversity or female leaders or employees in the company? We do. We do. And I actually think we're making a lot of great progress. And a specific example I'll give you is when you're hiring, especially at senior levels, we have the expectation that you're going to evaluate a diverse slate of candidates. And it may feel like it's a very process-driven requirement, But by getting exposure to more diverse slates of candidates over time will lead to more diverse candidates making it into the company. I'm a big believer in hiring from your network. Like there's nothing better than having direct experience and working with someone to validate that they're going to be good in a job that you're hiring for. So the more diversity you have in the people in your company, again, especially at the top, the more diverse networks, because we often form networks that look a lot like ourselves. (laughs) So I, for example, have a lot of women in my network. And so we also encourage tapping into people's networks and diverse networks in particular. And we're making progress. You know, listen, I wish we had more senior female leaders. I wish we had more people of color, but we are actively making progress. It is a huge focus for us. Yeah. And part of this is Women Leaders in Payments Month. So part of my podcast is trying to to elevate that, right? To And then I also do a Diversity and Inclusion Month. So also trying to elevate that. I think it's, I have learned, I mean, I am a company of one and I'm a consultant, but I work with a lot of different companies. I mean, I've done 171 of these episodes. So I'm talking to a lot of leaders and I definitely can feel and tell when diversity is important to them and whether that diversity is around female leaders or diversity in general. And I feel like, and I think research has proven it, that a diverse leadership team gives better results. I mean, ultimately the outcome, which is what every company wants, the results are better when there's a diverse leadership team. So I think it's so important. And I love that companies are doing more and more to 
have resource groups that can help and then they have very prescriptive hiring and things like that. I mean, all the things that you mentioned, I mean, I just think are so important and payments has been traditionally male dominated, but I do think progress is being made and I do think we still have a ways to go, but I do think it is getting better. Yeah. For me, diversity comes down to helping people feel comfortable being themselves. Like you're going to be more effective if you're comfortable in your own skin. And the best way to feel comfortable is feeling included, feeling valued for what you are, not what the norm is. And the more we can welcome people and their whole selves, whether it means they're a woman or whatever their sexuality is or their socioeconomic background or their ethnicity, if we just celebrate people for what they're bringing to the table that's uniquely them, then you start to foster diversity. And I think that's why teams that are more diverse are more successful is because people feel comfortable actually just being themselves in that kind of environment. Yeah, I totally agree. Well, this next question I'm stealing from another podcast host, a guy named Guy Raz, who is the host of a a podcast on NPR called How I Built This. And I just love the question. How much of your success do you attribute to your hard work versus luck? Yeah, I think it's both, but it really comes down to intention and what you're setting out to do, which I think then drives hard work and the perception of luck. Like I was describing to you some of the moments in time in my career, I felt literally like the stars aligned when I got the job in the strategic planning group at American Express. I really felt like the luckiest person on the planet. But I go back and I realize I made that happen. I put myself out there. I was putting things into the world that led that opportunity to coming my way. And all of my hard work and preparing for the four back-to-back case interviews and trying to learn about the company then made it successful. I just look at every pivot I made in my career and it was a combination of both. But I really think it comes down to intention, which drives your perception of hard work and of luck. Yeah, I've heard people answer it, and I think it summarizes what you said. The harder you work, the luckier you get. Yeah. And there's, I don't know if you, but there's the law of attraction or positive thinking. And my kids joke about manifesting things or willing things to happen. But I kind of think it's true. Like I, if you have a vision of something, you're moving in that direction. If you're really setting out to make that vision happen and it leads to you working on it, it leads to hard work. It leads to the feeling of luck and the feeling of things happening for a reason, but it wouldn't have happened if you weren't looking for it, if you weren't putting yourself out there. Absolutely. Well, Kathleen, we've covered a lot of ground today from your career, your views on women leadership in our industry. It's been a fascinating conversation. Is there anything else you'd like to discuss before we wrap up? No, I want to say thank you, Greg. I love what you're doing. I've listened to a bunch of the episodes of your podcast. I've learned a ton in listening and really felt inspired from each of them. And I just think payments is such an incredible space right now. There is so much innovation. I do think that We are changing the world by how we enable transactions to happen (laughs) between people, ultimately, which is what payments is. And so I just want to say thank you. This has been a great experience. I feel fortunate for myself and for SVB that you gave us this opportunity. So thank you so much for having me. No, thank you. Thank you for your time today. I know your time is very valuable. So again, thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Have an awesome day. You too. And to all you listeners out there, I thank you for your time as well. And until the next story. Thank you for joining us this week on the Leaders in Payments podcast. Make sure you visit our website at leadersinpayments.com, where you can subscribe to the show and where you'll find our show notes. If you enjoyed listening, please share on your social channels as well. 